Well, what a blessing it is to be here. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I've been touring the country quite a bit lately. In fact, I just went through an entire month without a day off. I'm tired. Had a couple days off this week, so that was good. And uh, next week, I actually get to go home and take a little break. So, uh, in fact, when I was, when I was coming over here, I, I had an event in um, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And... Uh, they were renting out to a Sunday church on Sunday. A Presbyterian church was renting on Sunday. And I try to get in there early and get everything done so when the Sunday church comes in, I'm out of their way and then they can do their service and then I come back and, you know, after they're gone. And uh, the pastor and his wife from the Sunday church come in extra early. I didn't know they come in extra early. And uh, I'm just kind of trying to scramble then to get things done in the kitchen. And the pastor's wife, she comes into the kitchen, and they're getting their communion stuff ready for service. And we started talking a little bit, and I was telling them what I do. And, and they were like, oh, yeah, I heard you do cooking shows around the country. And, and uh, talking to them for a little while, and she's like, and you don't even charge to go to these events or anything? And she says, that's just amazing. And, uh, and I just looked at her, and I said, well, after all, we're all Adventists. She kind of looks at me and she points her finger. She says, oh, I'm not an Adventist. And, and I looked at her and I said, well, by definition, I said the word Adventist means anticipating Christ's soon return. And I said, are you anticipating Christ's soon return? She says, yeah. And I said, well, then you're an Adventist. She says, well, I guess I am. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's so many people from denominations all over the world that are Adventists, they just have no idea that they are because they don't know the definition of the word. It's one of the best witnessing tools you have. It really is. It's amazing. Um, uh, okay, I've got some food for thought for you today. I've got so much to go over today. This is just a great Sabbath school, by the way, great Sabbath school. Um, but I better start with prayer. Let me, amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and bringing us all together and we just humble ourselves before the cross, Lord. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins, and we know that you have forgiven us, and you're such a righteous and just God. And we just want to be worthy of being in your presence in this holy home that you have provided for us. So we just ask that you're with us. Uh, use me as I surrender to you today to be the words that need to be spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, forgiveness is actually a really... Uh, I'll go into Kings here. Let me show this with you real quick here. Uh, I, uh, First Kings 14.8. Now, I found this three times in the Bible. And, and anytime I see something three times, then I'm really doing my homework. First Kings 14.8, and it says, And tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to you. And yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, only to do what was right in my eyes. Wait a minute now, God is saying that David kept all his commandments? Wasn't David an adulterer? I mean, he was a murderer, right? He sent Uriah to the front lines. So how could God be saying that David kept all his commandments? And if you remember, now this happened after David had died, and if you remember, David was always running to the Lord, wasn't he? Pleading for forgiveness. And it just goes to show you that God not only forgives us of all of our sins, he literally forgets every one of our sins. Definitely one of the mysteries of God. Um, Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. You know, the only one bringing up the sins of the past, that's Satan coming back saying, remember this, remember this, remember this. But God wants us to move forward with him in a mighty way. So anyway, um, yeah, I've got some great food for thought for you today. But I want to share with you a quick testimony. Uh, a lot of people don't know that I actually used to own a casino in Las Vegas. Yes, I had a casino in Las Vegas for quite a few years. And, uh, and um, now I grew up Catholic. I actually grew up in a Catholic home, went to church every Sunday. I was an altar boy, too. And, uh, and I left the Catholic Church the day I left home to go to college. And uh, like 92% of the population leaves their faith within two years of leaving home. And uh, went to college in Tacoma, Washington, and went, uh, got down to Lost Wages, Nevada, where everybody loses their paychecks, and uh, opened up a casino there. 
Now, this wasn't one of the big casinos like you'd see on television, but it wasn't one of the itty-bitty ones either. In fact, my dance floor area was about the size of this room. Sometimes I'd have as many people in my casino as you have in here right now. And let me tell you, those slot machines make a lot of money. Sometimes we were pulling $20,000 a week out of a slot machine. They make a lot of money. I got to the point where I could go anywhere I wanted to go, do anything I wanted to do, buy anything I wanted to buy, but I just did not feel like that was where God wanted me to be. And, uh, you know, my, my place was a great hangout, too, for all the FBI agents and CIA workers, all the city workers that was their hangout in town, and, and lots of police officers. And I didn't even carry donuts, but that's where they were. <laughs> I had good food. I had a place in the back where they could hide their cars. And, uh, yeah. And, of course, you got the built-in security, then all the women that worked the nightclubs, that's where they would go. So you got the women, you got the guys. So it was like that perfect mix for Sin City. But yeah, I just didn't feel like that was where God wanted me to be. And of course, I wasn't listening to God. You know, I was just kind of uh, doing my own thing. And, uh, but God kept showing me all the devastations, all the problems with that gaming business. I mean, I had moms coming in with their half-naked kids. Speaking of Mother's Day, they were coming in there with their half-naked kids, looking for their boyfriends or husbands who were blowing the paychecks in the slot machines. And, oh, you'd see that walk. Oh, they would be walking in there. As soon as I saw that walk, I knew what was going on. And we, my whole crew was trained how to deal with this. We'd take the kids and separate them, get them in the kitchen, get them something to eat. And then we'd take care of the big fight that's going on. And uh, women, too in there blowing their paychecks before they even go home and feed the family. And God was just showing me, you know, and of course I wasn't listening to God. Um, We had one kid did an armed robbery the day after he blew his paycheck in the slot machines. And my bartender was showing me the article in the paper. One thing after another after another. Uh, One senior couple, they used to come in and sign markers. And they would do like... uh, couple hundred here, a couple hundred there. By the end of the day, they may have spent a couple thousand dollars. Next day, the banks would open. They'd pay me, start gambling again. They did this for quite a few seasons in quite a few different properties. Ended up losing everything they had. Their retirement, their entire life savings, they lost their home, their vehicles. I had casino owners call me up saying, have you seen these people? They owe us money. I was like, yeah, but they skipped town in a beat-up pickup truck with a camper topper on the back. It's all they had. Had a bed in the back, you know, and I mean, this happened over and over. And I could, I could give every one of you $100 to play a slot machine on a marker. I mean, the, the, the money went in the slot machine. It never left the building. I mean, I could pull it out and give it to you again. Now you owe me $200. You know, it's, I want a lot of people playing on markers because if they win, they have to pay me first. And so the winnings don't leave the property. It's all business, you know. But uh, yeah, and you know, God was just kind of impressing upon me, impressing upon me, and I was kind of listening to God, but I wasn't listening the way I should. In fact, um, look up the word listen in the dictionary, okay? One of the definitions of the word listen in the dictionary is actually obedience. See, there's a lot of people listening to God with their ears, like I was, but they're not listening to God with their actions, doing what God is asking them to do. And that's kind of where I was. In fact, um, we had one, when when I was there was when the credit card machines were invented. That's how long ago I was in the business. And we got the credit card machines in the casino, and then my bartenders had them at the bars and stuff, and, and I... I didn't think nothing of it. Everybody's swiping their credit cards to get cash. And then one day I was back behind the bar and I was doing a liquor count. And I could hear this lady with my bartender saying, here, see if you can get $10 off this credit card. And it was like, no, how about five? Nope. Let's try another card. Literally trying every card in her purse, trying to get $5 to play a slot machine. I mean, isn't that horrible? Well, you know, that's nothing compared to finding her with a bullet in her head, committing suicide, and orphaning three kids. That's what that business does. That's Satan's job, to rob and destroy and kill. 
I mean, how do you think it felt to be at that funeral and everybody pointing the finger where the money went? Well, I never went to the funeral. And I said, am I getting that desensitized by this industry that I never went to a funeral? <laughs> you don't get casino owners at funerals. It's not our job to wonder where the money's coming from or what's happening to the people when they leave. But I prayed and prayed and I said, Lord, I know you got something better for me. I said, what do you want me to do here? And, and he says, get out of this business and I'll show you. And I got out of that business and I've never been back since. <laughs> and, and I had enough money. I mean, if I needed to take four or five years off of work, it wasn't an issue. Get in another line of work. Uh, ended up getting married. Thought I married Miss Wright. But I did not know her first name was Always. <sighs> yeah, I married Miss Always Wright. And... Uh, <laughs> Long story short, when the money was gone, so was she, you know. And, and you ever notice that? I, in fact, the closer I was getting to God, the farther away her and everybody was getting from me. The more I was reading the Bible and praying, and, and it was like everybody started disappearing. I ended up so broke that I ended up living in my car for a month. Now, a lot of people would give up on God at that time. You know, they're like, oh, we tried it your way. That sure didn't work out. They're testing Christ in a way they should not be testing him. And I said, no, I'm going to get even closer to Christ. I started spending time on my knees every single day. And let me tell you, 15 minutes a day on your knees, that is 1% of your day. And if you will just start spending 1% of your day with Christ, he'll change your life. Doesn't happen in a day or a week. It's consistency, month after month. I just got to the point where I had no desires to do anything but focus on Christ. You know, reading the Bible, morning, noon, and night in prayer. Started going to different churches in Las Vegas. I've been to over 200 different churches in Las Vegas. Personally, you know, and, and Las Vegas has more churches per capita than any other city in the country. And whatever sins you want, Vegas has a church for you. Oh, yeah, they're crazy. I find, yeah, I mean, I finally quit going to church. After about two or three, three, over three years of doing this, multiple services every week, and I finally said, that's it. We had, they have churches in Vegas. Um, I remember the pastor, uh, his church is actually inside the casinos. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the white chapels you get married at. I'm talking actual services. This one pastor drinks cocktails with the congregation before service at the bars. I have another pastor, and I talked with him a few times. He actually gives classes on how to play slot machines after service. <laughs> Justifies it with the Bible. He's like, well, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. <laughs> if you're not winning on those slot machines, you're not right with God. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Finally, I quit going to church altogether. I said, that's it. I'm not going to these churches. But I stayed in study. I stayed in prayer every day. And, of course, I'm watching these televangelists on television. And I'm picking out one mistake after another. Because this is, you know, a few years of, of reading and studying. And, and then I run across 3ABN on television. Which were, they were never there before either. I love when God does that kind of thing. And I'm watching, waiting to pick out mistakes. And the more I'm watching, I'm like, Wow. There's a church out there that's teaching the whole message. And I knew about the Sabbath because my brother's married to a Jewish girl. I always wondered why people weren't honoring the Sabbath instead of, you know, Sunday. And everything just started clicking. And I really started getting excited. I started going to Paradise Church in Las Vegas, the Seventh-day Adventist church there. Started sending donations to 3ABN, telling them what a good job they're doing. And then they gave me a call and said, well, you're a chef from Vegas. You need to come out and do some cooking programs for us. So I Paid for tickets myself and went out there a few times uh, doing cooking programs. Um, and then I ended up getting baptized by Jim Gilly over at 3ABN 10 years ago now. Yeah, and God's been using me ever since. Yeah, of course, yeah, praise to God. Praise goes to God, amen. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've, ever since then, we've actually done 1,500 cooking shows in every state now. Uh, this year, we're headed to Africa for three weeks. Um, uh, next year is Iceland. And we've never charged for food or transportation or anything, and God's just provided. And it's just amazing. I could share with you so many miracles of things that have happened around the country. It's just, uh, that would take a whole three or four sermons just to do that. And, uh, but um, 
Yeah, I want to share with you what a really upside down world this is, and uh, I've got some food for thought, because it is, and it's getting nuttier by the day. It, I, I go around the country and I see all this just crumbling, you know, throughout society. And um, uh, I mean, I can't even show you the billboards in Vegas. They're so horrible. I mean, there's ones that say, don't believe the truth. That's all it says. No company name or anything. There's other ones that say, obey the serpent for some nightclub. Um, uh, when my wife and I were down there, I've got a wonderful wife now, by the way. In fact, tomorrow I have, my wife, she's home taking care of her mom right now, who's 93 years old. So I get two Mother's Day celebrations, I'll be calling them and everything. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there's, um, when we were there, they had a big, massive po- uh, billboard downtown for a nightclub. And it said, come worship with us Thursday nights, the way Vegas prays. I mean, everything just, just horrible, horrible, horrible. Of course, luck is everywhere. Luck, luck, luck. You can't even go to the restroom without somebody wishing you good luck, you know. Man. Well, you know, luck was derived from Lucifer. Luck, Lucifer, same root word. Luck was derived from Lucifer to take favor away from God. How come t- every time something good happens in your life, you are lucky? But every time something bad happens in your life, we're supposed to uh, think that, oh, God had something to do with it. It was meant to be. You're supposed to learn a lesson. Let me tell you, if something bad happens in your life, I guarantee you Satan had something to do with it. And if something good happens in your life, we need to give God the praise and glory and thanks. Amen? Amen. Not be sitting here calling it luck. Wait, is it a potluck here or is it a fellowship meal? (laughs) Oh, it's a fellowship luncheon, okay. Woo. I mean, I'm from Vegas, but I don't want to roll the dice on the meal or anything, so. All right. In fact, when we were there, we had this one couple. They knew me from the casino business, and I was telling them how much money those slot machines make. They're like, man, you make that kind of money in the casino business, you need to get back in that business. And I just looked at them, and I said, why would I ever go back to Egypt when I see the promised land right in front of me? We're this close to the promised land. This is not the time to be running back to Egypt. But there's some things we really need in these last days, and really what we need is a lot more ADD. Now, I'm not talking the ADD that you get from the kids' cereals nowadays, okay? I'm talking godly ADD. We need action, direction, and discernment. Uh, James 1.22, uh, action... uh, James 1, be ye not just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, right? Right. Now, direction, I'm going to go to Psalms 5.3, because this is a different type of direction. Most people are like, Lord, give me direction. Give me, give me, give me. But Psalms 5.3, different type of direction, says, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will simply look up. See, we simply need to direct ourselves to the Lord so he can do the mighty work. It's it's very simple. God has really made everything he does simple. Satan's the one that tries to complicate everything. Uh, Discernment. I'm going to go a little bit farther here into Proverbs. Proverbs 2, 3 through 5. Discernment is so critical in these last days. Um, It is. Proverbs 2, 3 through 5. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, if you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Yeah, oh. And um, action, direction, and discernment. I'm going to put all three of these together here. We're going to go to Hosea 12, 6. I'll put all three of these together. Action, direction, and discernment all in the same scripture here. Hosea 12, 6. Now, if you have an NIV version, it says, wait for the Lord. My Bible here is actually a New King James Version. It says, to serve the Lord always. And then the original meaning, or no, mine says, wait on your God continually. And then the original meaning says, to serve the Lord always. So here's different versions of the Bible that went from serving the Lord always to waiting for the Lord? 
Isn't that like the exact opposite? Satan loves to change things just bit by bit in different versions and stuff. Now, there is a time to wait for the Lord, amen? But in this particular case, we're supposed to wait on the Lord with action, serving him. Like a waiter or waitress waits on somebody in a restaurant, that's what waiting on the Lord means. Yes, action, direction, and discernment. In fact, y'all know, here's another one. Y'all know Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? That's not the original meaning. If you go into the Greek, the original meaning never had the word can in there. I can do all things is all about self. Now you get rid of the word can and the scripture goes like this. I do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What a difference that scripture has when you get yourself out of the way. I do all things is all about conviction. That's what we need to have. We need to have godly conviction in everything you do. I mean, if you put godly conviction in your health, God will do amazing things with your health. Put godly conviction in your family and watch the amazing things God does with your family. Put conviction in finance, in your job. We need godly conviction. I do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Faith is another one that there's so many people that think we're saved by faith. After all, that's what the Bible says. I have people all the time, oh, I've got faith. My faith is what saves me. If your faith is what saves you, what do you need a savior for? See? The saving faith that the Bible talks about is actually the covenant that Christ has with us. That's the saving faith. Not of yourself. Uh, There's a difference between faith in Christ and faith of Christ. Do we need faith? Absolutely. But it's the saving faith that's actually the salvational saving faith. uh, Look, if you have righteousness by faith and it's based on your faith, that's simply self-righteousness. It needs to be righteousness based on his faith, see? Big differences here. I mean, hope is another one. Oh, Satan puts so many people in a state of hope nowadays. All right, that got quiet. Yes, Satan is in charge of hope. You got to get this. You got to get this. this. These are definitions of hope in the Bible. Definitions of hope. Uh, safety, assurance, boldly, confidence, security. Well, there are some good definitions of, of, of hope. Place of refuge. These are definitions of hope in the Bible too. Without care. Carelessness. To attach oneself, once again, self again. Uh, to be careless. Uh, The folly of relying upon any other type of security strongly contrasted with depending on God alone. Now we have bipolar hope. And my favorite definition here of hope, an expressed sense of resignation. There is nothing more one can do. So we have to understand there's a difference between hope being a noun, our hope is Jesus Christ, and hope being a verb, which is that earthly ungodly hope. But what Satan has done is what I call the bundling effect. He's taken all the definitions and he bundles it all into one package. And then he hands it off to society and says, all you need is hope and everything's going to be fine. That is literally a form of insanity. You know what insanity is, right? Doing the same thing over and over but expecting a different result. That's what people are doing with hope today. They're hoping they get a job without ever looking for a job. They're hoping the economy changes, and they're hoping a new administration can help things in society. Uh, They're hoping their health changes without ever changing their lifestyle. It's literally a form of insanity. I mean, is there going to be hope in heaven? No, because we're going to have our hope fulfilled in heaven, amen? Amen. And that's the way we need to be here on earth today is having our hope fulfilled, knowing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, not hoping he is our Lord and Savior. Catching the differences here? But Satan does this bundling effect. Grace is another one. You know, grace used to be something so precious and so reverent. 
Um, and it's just got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over the years. Now it's free grace for everybody. I would much rather hear it be called priceless grace. I mean, you know the price that was paid on the cross for this grace that society's taken so frivolously nowadays? I mean, especially this youngest generation. I mean, every song on the radio is free grace, free grace, free grace. I mean, and, and they actually believe that they get free grace without ever going to church, without ever tithing, without ever praying, without ever reading the Bible. I got free grace. That would actually be called disgrace, okay? Big differences here. You know, and, and by the way, if you look at salvational grace, it's conditional. It's freely given. But don't you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in order to receive it? See, it's freely given, but it's conditional. You have to accept it. Do your part. The reason I point this out, too, is you know, going to all these churches over the years and non-denominational of every kind, I discovered that there's, there's all these different types of churches. There's these hope churches and these faith churches and these grace churches and, and, and the obedient churches. Oh, as long as you obey God's commandments, then you'll be saved. You know, see, that's Satan's way to divide and conquer. He just wants you to have tunnel vision on one thing and ignore the rest. Bottom line is you cannot go to heaven without grace. You can't go to heaven without faith, Christ's saving faith. You can't go to heaven if you're going to refuse to obey God's commandments. This is why God gave us the whole Bible, not just a fraction of it. We need the whole message, not just bits and pieces of it. And now it's the love churches. Whew. Love churches everywhere. Free love. Love, love, love. That's all they want to preach. This is from Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, page 292. I have seen the results of these fanciful views of God in apostasy, spiritualism, and free loveism. The free love tendencies of these teachings was so concealed that at first it was difficult to make plain its real character. And until the Lord presented it to me, I knew not what to call it, but I was instructed to call it unholy spiritual love. See, when you start studying the cross, start studying Revelation, the sanctuary, especially the cross, you're going to understand the depth of Christ's love instead of that shallow love that the world is throwing out there. You're going to understand true grace instead of the fake grace that the world is presented with. This is why we need the whole message. Read more, study more, pray more. Get to those Sabbath schools. Start a Bible study in your home. You know, start digging into this Bible and really, God is going to open up such amazing things. You're just going to be so amazed when you start doing this. This is the great controversy, page 595. The multitudes do not want biblical truth because it interferes with the desires of the sinful, world-loving heart. And Satan supplies the deceptions which they love. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and only the Bible as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. And she continues here. Um, Satan is now putting forth his utmost effort for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform him marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the truth that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by holy scriptures. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. That's where we're at. We're at that last great conflict and Satan is putting out so many deceptions that are just a mirror image of what truth is, but it's not. That's why we need the Bible for this. It's just read more, study more, pray more. Uh, um, I got time here. I'm going to share with you a couple, uh, another one here. Um, of course, you're going to have to go to your Bibles on this one. How many of you know that it's the saved people who are burning for all eternity? 
Anybody? Saved people are the ones burning for all eternity. I got a few people, okay. What, what, where am I going here? Did I give you the scripture yet? No, uh, okay, Isaiah 33, 14. So it's gonna be Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. We'll get that on the screen. Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. Yes, it's the saved people who are burning for all eternity. This answers a lot of questions too about eternal hellfire and things like that. Um, here we go. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Here's the answer. He who walks righteously and speaks upright, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Let me tell you, shut those TVs off. I can't even watch the morning news anymore without half a dozen commercials about aliens killing zombies or something. I just wanted the weather report. It's just, it's horrible. He will dwell on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him and his water will be sure. Hebrews 12.29 says that God is a consuming fire. Now we are going to be in the presence of this consuming fire for all eternity. Now, of course, we're not going to be harmed in any way, shape, or form. I mean, look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, they went through the fiery furnace. They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out because they were in the presence of the Lord. And I'm thinking about this, and I said, you know what? If we're going to be burning for all eternity, why don't we be on fire for the Lord now? Why are we going to wait till Christ returns? We should be on fire for this Lord right now, so bright that this community is saying, boy, I don't know what it is about that person or that person or this congregation in this church, but I want some of that. That's how bright we should be shining right now. I think they were going to bring the kids in here. You might want to, if they're going to come in for the painting, we might want to go grab them. But I, I'll, let me do one more story here for you, too. Um, because, you all know the story of Matthew 20 with the farmer in the vineyards? And the farmer goes into town to get more help, and then he goes back again and again, and even in the 11th hour, the farmer goes back to get more help. To, and the whole lesson of the story is supposed to be, uh, doesn't matter when you come into the fold, you get the same reward, right? That's the whole lesson. Okay, there's so much more to this story, let me tell you. Uh, I was over in California last year, and it was a little before the harvest season. They had a massive storm coming in from Washington and Oregon. They knew it was going to wipe out their crops. And they were on every broadcast, all over radio and everything, saying anybody and everybody who can possibly get out in the fields, we need you to come out and harvest this crop or we're going to lose it all. And the light bulb went off with me. I said, there was a storm on the horizon that day. That's why the farmer went back into town to get more help. Think about this. This guy, is, he's a professional farmer. He knew exactly how many people he needed to harvest that crop. And the storm's getting bigger and bigger. He's like, boy, I better go back and get more help. He goes back over and over. Even in the 11th hour, he's going back to get more help. Look, if there wasn't a storm on the horizon, he would have said, guys, come back tomorrow. We'll finish the job. The problem is there was no tomorrow. And look at these 11th hour, look at these 11th hour people. They, they were, um, they were, the Bible says that they were looking for work all day long and couldn't find work. And the bar farmer says, come out, come, you know, get out in the fields, I'll pay you. They didn't even know how much they were getting paid. They were so excited, well, that they weren't going to have to go home to their wives empty-handed. That was part of it. It's probably why they didn't go home. <laughs> but they were so excited that they weren't going to have to go home with nothing. They were out there running in the fields, and they were picking up the grapes, and they'd run it over to the cart, and they were like, yeah, we get to go home with something. They were so excited the rest of the people in the fields actually stopped working. That's where our church is today. It's a story about the church. Ellen White says in Christ Object Lessons that they were paid based on their spirit. This is page 397. And 
that the people that were there all day had no spirit to serve. And on page 400, this is her statement. There is nothing more offensive to God than this narrow, self-caring spirit. He cannot work with anyone who manifests these attributes. They are insensible to the work of his spirit. So my question to you is, where's your spirit going to be in these end days? Are you going to be one of the ones sitting in the pews wondering what's going on? Or are you going to become an active participant in finishing the work? Now, how do you get filled with the Spirit? It is through the ministry of participation. Be an active participant of this church. Join the welcoming committee. Join the pathfinders. Do something, anything. When you actually do something, that's when God can fill you up with a feeling of accomplishment, and then you're going to say, wow, I want to do more. This is the spirit of participation. If you're going to do an evangelistic series, part of the spirit of participation is just simply attending. You don't have to do anything but sit in the pews. I'll tell you what a blessing it is to have a majority of people coming from the church, especially for visitors. If, if nobody shows up from the church... Why would they believe it? You're not even showing up. Part of that participation is simply attendance. And when you get the spirit of participation, all of a sudden, God just fills you up so much, you just want to do more, and you want to do more. And that's when you get excited. And we should be excited in these last days. Christ is going to be here so soon. So soon. All right, I get to do a painting today. Okay, I haven't done one in a while. The spirit of participation. Action, direction, discernment. I'll see y'all in just a little bit.
Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. God has a purpose and a plan for every one of us. And we, when we start actively taking those steps in action, direction, discernment, that's when he reveals what's next. So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We thank you for bringing us all together. We pray that you'll not only share with us how to hold this Sabbath day as a day of reverence, but also a day of celebration, a mere image of that thousand-year Sabbath that you have waiting for us just around the corner. And we look so forward to those trumpets sounding in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And just to let you know, I, I got to point this out because I always forget. I am blindfolded, but I don't want people thinking there's some mysticism or something going on. There's actually a foam board behind there that's all carved out. So I just feel my way through the whole painting. And just takes a little practice, a little training. And, and see, that's what we need to do. We just need to be consistent in allowing God to train us and practice the principles that he has given us. So, amen. Amen. <laughs>